The following interview was conducted with Horace Parlberg for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, March 19, 2009, at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little about where you were born and your early well, years and parents. I don't know how much time you want to take with this, but I was born a long time ago, in, in August of 1923, on a small 10-acre farm that my father had, which was a derivative of that which his grandmother had, homesteaded in 1847 when she came from the Netherlands. She came with seven children and her husband died at sea, so she had a kind of a tough time. Uh, then that, as often happens, those farms got smaller and smaller, and my father had 10 acres, and he was ambitious, so he sold that to his brother in 1926 and moved to Crown Point, where I grew up. And I went to... Uh, Tell us know, what grade school was like. Was it? I went to a, an eight, eight grades to one room grade school. One room? Yeah. <laughs> With one teacher for six years who was not a good mathematician, which accounts for my inadequacies. <laughs> anyway, he was a nice guy, and we got along fine for eight years. And then I went to high school in Crown Point, where I had a class of about 90 people, uh, kids, and they were a part, that's when cliques developed. We were the rural people, they were the city people, and we had to take a couple of years to get integrated back into things. So I was a kind of a timid high school kid, didn't, Excel. I was a. I never. I never worked very hard, but I found school an enjoyable and interesting experience. Any clubs that you joined? No, I, don't know. I was in the honor society, but that was not through joining. That was just by being there. And uh, I was. I took vocational agriculture, which I, in hindsight, uh, am not too pleased about because it was. It was directed toward production agriculture and nothing else, and to the exclusion of some academic courses that would have benefited me more. But that's all water under the bridge. And so I um, uh, got out of high school in 1941 and uh, began work, working on my father, who had a kind of a, um, uh, a historical attitude of how families ought to be raised. And he thought he'd work for the dad until you were 21 and maybe longer if he thought so. And uh, my older brothers, in fact, did do that. But you the, are you the youngest? I am the youngest of four, yes. And uh, I have, uh, I'm have i the survivor of the generation now. Um, but uh, I worked there at on the home farm, and the war came, and I was deferred as an agriculturally essential worker. Right? And I was because we had a, hired a lot of labor, and we had Mexicans, and we had uh, Eastern European women out of Chicago, and we had... Um, uh, neighbor kids and all that kind of stuff. So it was a wonderful enhancing experience for me. I learned a lot of sociology just just hoeing weeds, you know, and, and that was a, a beneficial, I think. And uh, But I had about enough of that. All my friends were in service, and I felt like I was a do-nothing guy. So when my classification, next time it came 1A, I, I said, well, we won't, we won't put that question forward as we had before. I'll just go. Oh, he didn't think that was a good idea at all. He he understood the term I learned in college called unpaid family labor. He understood that very well. And anyway, I left and went to service in the Navy for a couple of years and got out. And you were, did, where did you serve outside? I was a, I was a water boy. I um, took a test which said I could be a radio man, which was a, a ridiculous test because I don't know one tone from the other, and I had to listen to Morse code all day, and it went in my ears and came out of my eyes, and I was so glad when that 20-week course was over, and I barely made it, and, and it would have been a catastrophe to put me in charge of communications on a ship somewhere, because I couldn't do it. But anyway, uh, then I went back to Great Lakes and worked in, um, in, in the separation center. The, by that time, the war was over, and sailors, sailors were coming back, and I wrote out sheets on on their their record of their where they had been, and I was there for six months or so, and then I went to uh, Bremerton, Washington, for uh, six or eight months in the in the um, mothballing of the 19th Fleet, 
we were putting all these ships in mothballs. And I didn't know anything about that either, but uh, since I was called a yeoman, which I really wasn't, I typed the best I could, and I was on a an old scow tied up at a dock, and it, uh, it swarmed with officers and administrative personnel and me and a few other guys that emptied waste baskets and such. But I, I learned a lot there. I learned that people are people, and you don't have to be afraid of some guys sure. because he got stripes on his shirt. So uh, I, got, I then applied for Purdue while I was in in Bremerton, and I received my admission just prior to leaving. I came home, was home a week, and went to Purdue. Okay. Let me backtrack a little bit. What was the war like for your family during the war? Was there any problems at all? I mean, you no. got stamps or... Well, I had a cousin who was killed, and oh. I had a few neighbors, two neighbors, who didn't come back, and a lot, all my friends... But where I lived, when you came back from the war, you just, you, well, when you got out of high school, you went to the mills or you went to the service. And when you got back from the service, you went to the mills. And they worked in the steel industry, sure. which in the course of time wasn't a very good idea. But they, that's where they all went. And the proportion of my class that went to college was not very great, maybe 6 or 8%. But I and I didn't consider myself an academician in any sense of the word, but but I th I thought I did enjoy learning, and so I came down here and for a while knowing anything better, I took agriculture, which in hindsight. What year I, was this now? Would be 46? I came here in, in uh, fall of forty six. Okay, all right. What was the campus like? Oh, I don't know. It was up to here and soldiers everywhere. That's what I've heard. And I, I talked to a number of the retired teachers here. They say that was the best time of teaching they had in their career. These guys wanted to get in and learn and get out. And move on. Move on. They, they were already behind and right. they didn't want to waste any more time. And yeah. I felt that way too. And they had families in many they, cases. Some had families and, and some wanted to get married and have their family and relocate. Yeah, it was an interesting time. Where did and you where did you live on campus? Then? I lived in the house. I cheated. In order to get in here, you had to give an address. I didn't have an address, so Don's wife's father had an address, and I used it. And he would have slapped me over for a while, and did. And then uh, after a while, I rented a house from uh, Professor Lloyd, who was the head of the Ag Econ department. And I stayed there for about six months, and then the Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity invited me into there, and I spent the rest of my time in there, which was a wonderful thing for everybody. I enjoyed was it. Was your brother here at that time, or had he? He came at about the same time I did. Yeah, he came in the fall of 46. He came from Cornell, or he had had his Ph.D. Oh, completed. he was coming on as a faculty member at yeah. that time. Oh, okay. Yeah. He'd already be. Did he, he do his undergraduate work here? He did, he did? yes. He did okay. his undergraduate work here. Don lay out of school eight years between high school and college, doing nothing, really, working hard on the farm. On the farm. The more you did, the worse off you were in those days. And uh, he, he graduated, I think, about 27, and he went to college in 36, something like that. Okay, okay. And uh, so um, uh, he, he was, he, he missed, he could have been in school when there were no wages to be made anyway, but didn't have any money, so sure. we solved that that way. Right. And uh, so and also, when you were here, there were no the t there was no tuition. There were it was for me. I know nothing about tuition. The GI Bill covered all that oh, okay. stuff. All right. Uh, I admire that bill as much as any legislation I have ever known of. That and the land grant college right. bill. All right. Those two things. Where the best legislation. Where were your classes held? Because the Craner School was not built at that time. No. no. Were they? Uh, oh, they were around. <laughs> different, whatever the buildings. Quonset Hut, some. Okay. And um, and uh, we had classes in Ag Hall, what was then became the Entomology Building, and uh, well, where else they were? Maybe something in University Hall might have been. Yeah, uh, I had a few in there. Cleveland Hall, the old one, was still around. Too. Yeah, yeah, uh, and Chemistry Building. You go to sure. Chemistry and. And uh, it was, the classes were adequate. Univer there used to be an education building somewhere right. there. And, right. And Over it's actually where the liberal art, where the bearing building is now. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And that was. Uh, and you had the train that went through the campus for the coal. 
Yeah, I don't remember much about that, but I know it did. Sure. And uh, I know that the smokestack was a landmark, and I admired that. I thought it was great. Pity to see it leave, but that's progress. <laughs> and uh, no, I had a good time in college, and I went. I worked my last. I worked. I got through school in three and a half years by going to a summer school. And then I worked for the university the two, two other summers that I was here. I took records for Purdue out over the state for the Ag economics department. And uh, very interesting work, and I learned a lot about self-initiative and so on. You had to go see these people and, and stay as long as it took. And uh, you, Were you gathering data from gathering them? Gathering data on hog marketing. But the one I enjoyed mostly was the study of the uh, Professor Lloyd, for whom I had, with whom I had roomed, uh, had the, he was more of a sociologist than an economist, and he had the view that keeping the farm in the family was a sacred thing to do. Well, <laughs> I interviewed farms that had been in the family a hundred years, and then I talked to these people and said, well, how was it you're able to do this wonderful thing? All this time. All this time, and they looked down their nose and said, it isn't as wonderful as you think it is. And that was the sum and substance of the interviews, all of them almost. Hmm. Usually there was some guy that got, he had four or five brothers and sisters and they left to uh, seek fortunes otherwise. And he stayed there with mom and dad and didn't get married because there wasn't any room for that. And, and after he got to be 60 years old, dad finally let him decide a thing or two. And he made improvements on the farm at his own expense. And then when, when he... Uh, when his parents died, he had to buy from the others, not only the original farm, but the improvements he had made at his own expense. He was not a happy man. So there's some pros and cons to that sure, stuff. I understand. Yeah. Well, I did that in the summers, and then I, when I got out of school, I worked. What uh, year did you receive your degree? I got out in, in January of 50. Uh -huh. And I went right to work at Farm Craft Service Incorporated, a little farm management uh, appraisal, farm appraisal, farm realty company up here at Oxford, 20 miles away. And I uh, uh, went there in January of 50, roomed up there, and then my wife was still in school, so I commuted to see her frequently on, on the Were evenings. you married at that time? No. Oh, okay. I got married in August after I'd been in January there. Then we both went together to Oxford, and I lived in a hole, and I... I have since wondered about a lot of things. I wondered what her parents thought of the first place they found their daughter. What what was it like? Was it, it a wasn't house? as big as this room. <laughs> it had a bedroom, which you had to get in bed from the other room. You step right into it, and a bathroom. You could sit on the stool and wash your hands at the same time, and. And Everything I, was in fingertip reach. Yeah, <laughs> it was convenient. <laughs> but uh, we heated it with a, with a kerosene stove. It was second floor. We went up on the fire escape and came down on the fire escape. Outside. Outside. And that was where we lived for a year and a half. Pretty, And her, her parents came to visit us there, and I always wondered what they thought about this. <laughs> well, we're working our way. Yeah, we're, we can only improve from there. That's right. Well, you got along it's better. A, we, we rented a little house in the corner of town, and then after a couple of years more, we bought a little house in the, near the middle of town. And then in 1962, Earl let me Bunch, ask you, what was the, the nature of that uh, company? Did you go around and appraise farms? Is we that, oh, we were we were agents for absentee landowners. Okay. If they lived in Cleveland or Chicago or Cincinnati or somewhere. We would take the responsibility of the landowner for the decisions that had to be made in a joint tenant operation. That was long before the uh, era of cash rents. Now we have cash rents, which are simpler by far. But uh, in those days, we had share rents. And every time we'd uh, buy a bull, we had to do that together. And we'd decide on fertilizer and seed corn and all, all the decisions that an owner should make. And we would. Ha I had about... 25 farms, something like that. Plenty to keep All busy. within that surrounding area? All, with, all within uh, 50 miles, I would say. Okay. And I had them kind of clustered at Rensselaer and, and Monticello and so on. And uh, then in, in August, I got married, and and we lived there. We'd go west to buy cattle, feeder cattle, uh, each fall, and I enjoyed that immensely. And... Uh, I go to the professional meetings that were held 
uh, every year in Chicago in November, and then every summer somewhere in the United States. The American Society sponsored these, and I would load up the family of four kids, and we would take a trip to wherever it was, Oregon or, or Florida or I forgot where we went. Went to close places like Ohio sometimes. Sure. But uh, we traveled extensively, and I was so glad. And I thought maybe the kids were just bored on this, riding along in a hot, air, non-air-conditioned car over the west, and it's 100 degrees. And But once in a while, they'll still say, do you remember? And they were that high, and they remember. And, uh, oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, <laughs> I you remember do. things. You do. Yeah. More yeah. than you know. That's right. Because uh, anyway. it isn't discussed for a long time, then all of a sudden it... It time because it broke me at the time. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I didn't get that when I wanted for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we did in summers, and my wife did not work. She uh, was active in... Uh, my father-in-law was a big mason, and she and her, and, her, and her mother was in Eastern Star, and this was a big activity. And uh, so I thought I could not be wrong for me to join the Masons, and I did. It was a little bit contradictory to my heritage because the Dutch people believed in the Christian Reformed Church, which didn't think secret societies had any place in the world. Mm. Anyway, we got I joined them, and I enjoyed it, and I profited by it. I learned a little discipline of remembering how to do ceremonies and so on. And my wife enjoyed the Eastern Star immensely, and. Uh, we did that all the time. We were in Oxford, and I went. Did you keep in touch with your brother at that time? Because was he at Purdue? Yeah, he oh. was at Purdue. Okay, and I would come down here frequently. Mm -hmm. And then in '52, when we were still in Oxford, uh, he called me one day and said, "Stop in on your way by on Christmas or something." And then he told me he was going to go to Washington, and I was perplexed. I didn't know what that was all about, but he did. By January of the sometime or other, he was gone. And uh, served there for eight years. In that, in Eisenhower's first, in Eisenhower's term, and then he went back eight years after Kennedy and Johnson, and served in Nixon's eight years. Mm. I was going to ask you. You mentioned Eisenhower. That uh, Food for Peace program. He was sort of in charge well, of that. Well, Don was <laughs> um, the economic advisor to the Secretary of Agriculture. That was his job. Then the Public Law 480 came up, a, a law in which this country, having a surplus and wanting any way we could re get rid of it, uh, we agreed to, to sell that to countries in, in need of food for their money, not ours. They would leave it in their country, and we would spend it uh, to some degree in our interest, but mostly in theirs, in their country. Sure. And we sent millions and millions of dollars worth, tons and tons of wheat. This was, in, in India's case, we shipped the 480 wheat to India way before the Green Revolution, when, when Norman Borlaug came in and bred the wheat that yielded so well, which made India a surplus instead of a deficit wheat country. Anyway, we saved a lot of Indians that way, mm -hmm. and uh, Don was more proud of that activity than any other. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of a lot of fire calls with he was well he he did that after he had become economic advisor to President Eisenhower. Eisenhower put that for Public Law 480 job on him. Yeah, I read that. That's how yeah. it came into existence. Yeah. And um, so he then after Nixon, he was not pleased with Mr. Nixon at all. And I saw what you read. You said talked to Earl Butts, and he said he worked. For Nixon and with Ford, mm. Don said the same thing. Mm. He said Ford was a fine man, and uh, honest and straightforward. And Nixon was a paranoid. He knew very, everybody very hated good. him, and they was right. <laughs> everybody did hate him. Anyway, uh, Don was glad then to come back to Purdue, and I guess by that time he was near retirement. Now he taught for a while after uh -huh. after he was here a little bit. Yeah. And he never did quit teaching. He loved to teach, and he took on special assignments and traveled a good bit uh, for other assignments. I don't know just what, but he went to Brazil for Purdue a time or two, and so that was that his worked realm. out. 
Lynn, tell us about how you came to Purdue then. Uh, well, to, that's an interesting yeah. story. I was managing these farms. I'd done it for a dozen years, and the dog got old, and the kids grew up, and and uh, I said, No oh, cats, just a dog? <laughs> no. <laughs> Where? They, they wander in, you know. <laughs> I've got two of them. Well, I was talking to those on the farms that I had. That dog that was a puppy when I came was now dying of old age, and I began to wonder where this was taking me over time. So one day when, after Earl Butts came back here and was dean, I went into his office just unsolicited and said, if the job of working at managing Purdue Farms ever comes up, put me on the list of interested people. And I walked on, on my way. And a year or so later he called and said, we have an opportunity here on the animal sciences farms at Purdue, which was not my kind of work. I had done farm management but I had not done foremanship, which is an entirely different game. But I came here and I took on all of the lands, all of the new city out here was in the Purdue farm system. Uh, is there in here? I used to grow corn right here. <laughs> yeah, in 62 and 3, we grew corn over all this stuff here. and. Uh, that was all Purdue Farms. All Purdue Farms. And we had an agreement with the city that we would gracefully retreat and buy land somewhere else. So after we, I had been here for three years, we hadn't found any other land, but we were still farming all of this for the Purdue Research Foundation and Purdue University, these two entities. And then I uh, began to think I better be looking. So I looked and looked and looked and talked to people within a reasonable distance here and uh, worked closely with the Purdue Research Foundation, Wynn Hinchel, one of the nicest men I ever knew. Yeah, that's what I've heard. A great guy. Anyway, Wynn fumbled around and we called on different people and, and uh, we found some land just north of town, adjacent to the agronomy farm, contiguous to the agronomy farm, which made sense to me. And, um, we got, I don't know how many acres, 1,500 acres out there, something like that, in different tracks. And um, we were slow, and we got the old Calvert farm, which had been the farm of Henry Marshall when he was in his glory uh, section, 640 acres. And we got uh, the farm of from uh, a... a um, uh, oh, my. A Vanada relative who had inherited it from the Vanada uh, business through his wife. And uh, so we got farms there. We Part of it went to agronomy. Most of it went to the animal sciences farms. So we got out of here pretty pretty good. And uh, transferred... You had what you, what's now a university farms. That was also part of that, it's, which is just around close. Yeah. yeah. I have, we used to have the dairy farm, and I got all kind of a racket from people about the smell of the silage and the manure and, and all that stuff, and we put up with that. But as soon as we could get away, we did. Sure, right. and, uh, if you went out Cherry Lane, that's what, that, that was that, where that was. Sure, I remember Yeah, where that. Bill Daniels Golf Course is. Right. Beautiful barns, ridiculous. I did have some trouble finding my way. Well, after I'd been here uh, three years on the animal sciences farms, then the director of the regional farms retired what, Earl, what, would, what would be considered the regional farms? Well, that would be all over the state of Indiana. Oh, okay. They were nine. But they're owned by Purdue? Yes. Okay. And they're, I'm thinking of researchers and say regional. What do you mean by that? Regional research, which is, well, as the, as the soils and climate vary within the state, there are certain different demands on, on agronomic crops, different insect uh, situations, different soil conditions. And so um, we have these regional research farms where a, a, a researcher who lives at Purdue or works and teaches perhaps, but does some hands-on research, would have a technician. And he and the technician would outline the research that was to be done. And then the staff at these regional farms, for, who were my responsibility, we would do all the preparatory work, all the non-scientific work that went to support that activity. And uh, and we kept... Did you hire the people that worked on the regional farms yeah, too? Yeah, yeah. They all reported to you? Yeah. Well, they reported to their superintendent okay. who reported to me. Okay. I had nine good guys out there, just great fellows. I inherited most of them. 
but I had to replace a few through retirement, but uh, I was just very fortunate. And I've had my successors express the same opinion that we've got a good group of guys out there. We really are kind of a mission-oriented place out there. We are Purdue in that neighborhood, yeah. and we need to act like it. And so the extension service, I did do a thing I thought significant. That Well, when I began, I would have to say I was embarrassed uh, at the status of those farms. They had been the child of the Dean Reed, and he had been the farm director before he was Dean. He was a horticulturalist. And I don't know, didn't know Dean Reed very well. I have never heard anything uncomplimentary about him, but he didn't know much about, it didn't seem to me about agronomy, animal sciences, or human nature. <laughs> I don't think he really ran those farms the way he wanted them run, which was an adequate way. Uh, for instance, at the farm at Bedford, we had, I think, six or seven houses on it, and there wasn't a bathroom in a one of them. This was 1965. That was humiliating. Well, because we had, I, I had a good, some good deans that helped me get away with it, and because we did a lot of our own work, our superintendents put in the bathrooms or demolished the house when we built a house, and we got those farms up to speed, and I feel great about that. Right. Were many of, excuse me, many of the farms, were they given to the university? Many were given to okay. us, yes. As part of a, a trust or land? Many were right? given if, to us. We got some on an, on an annuity basis. That is to say that old Mrs. Jones was 80 years old and, and had the farm from her father, and she had no children. Her father said never get rid of the farm, but she knew it when she died it would happen. So she gave it to Purdue under the assurance that we would <coughs> set a value on it and pay her an interest rate on that value as long as she lived. It was a great comfort to that, those yeah, people. I would and think so. And got a good farm out of it. Sure, that's right. And then you would take care, you would farm it while she's around? Yes, while still she was there. living. Well, we'd farm it. Uh, in some instances, though, we uh, eventually, mo like most, Purdue is like any other big organization. They would rather manage paper than property. And so if, if it was possible to sell a farm, we would usually sure. sell it to the neighborhood. And besides, the neighborhood didn't like Purdue University, their neighbor. They wanted them their neighbor, but they didn't li They suspected that we didn't pay taxes. We always did on those kinds of farms. Sure. But they always were a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I, I really had a wonderful experience. I can't imagine anybody having a, a better experience. I, I was at the right place at the right time. I retired at the right time. When did you retire? I retired in, in the last day of 1989, just ahead of the flow of the new information system. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, did you have to, was, was it 65, did you have to retire at 65? Or? I guess you had to, but I was ready to run oh, okay. because this new technology was overwhelming me. I could keep up, I had a wonderful way to keep up in those days. If we had a specialist in weed control that was running a study at Southeast Indiana, uh, if he was going to go down there, I'd say, well, in order to save a little transportation, let's go together. And I would ride down there, and we would visit for three hours on the way down there. And, and, I you learned, learned, and you, it's informative. I learned a lot, <clears throat> right. a great lot, about a specialty that I would never have known about. All right. The same way with the animals and, and uh, things like that. So I had a wonderful opportunity to keep abreast of those things but I didn't have any way of keeping abreast of modern technology. Yeah. At a southern Indiana farm, we had electric wires for telephones running from a bush to a shrub, and sometimes we didn't speak to them for days. That was not good. What about the vet, the veterinary farms? Were that under your supervision? That was not under my control. We had, in addition to the farms that I directed, the uh, regional farms, the agronomy farm was administered by the agronomy department. Okay. The veterinary science was administered by the Veterinary Science Department. Those were specialty farms. And uh, I did provide the uh, succeeding agronomist, uh, the, the superintendent of the agronomy farm, 
was my old employee. <laughs> we did do some of that. We are a little inbred, but not bad. That's all right. And the guy out, out there now, the guy that I hired to, and we went out there, uh, he's raised three superintendents of other farms, and he's by his own training. And that's great. That's nice. That's yeah. right. It yeah. really is good. And, and in-house promotion has some reward, some merit. And uh, right. we didn't hire some guy out of Tennessee or someplace. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. The homebred is really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a lot of a lot of history that goes with these farms. They got to know who gave them to us and why and what for. And, and then, you need all the documentation. Yeah. That's sure, right. Exactly. Sure. But PRF did all that administrative work for me. Or I did all the, all the uh, personnel and, and uh, for instance, we had, oh, I'll give you an example of Winnich, what kind of a guy this is. He's deceased now, is he not? He he, he's passed away. He's not alive. No, he's he? no longer alive. They've named a street or two over here. After. Right, when he, up there in the research park. Yeah. And, uh, but when he was a civil kind of a fellow, sincere, not overbearing, but just a congenial kind of a simple fellow. He'd stumble over the threshold and went in the door, you know, kind of awkward. And, and people just naturally believed him. Well, we had gotten a farm from Vern Freeman, Dean Freeman, down by Rushville. I remember the acreage, but it was rather substantial acreage. And we had had it appraised. We told Vern we were going to try to turn it into money, which he understood. I guess it was really his wife's farm, Phyllis. But anyway, it was okay with Vern. So we are going to sell it. So we got it in. We, we uh, had it appraised at $2,500 an acre. And we sold it for that. And the guy who bought it got along a year or so, and then he, then the, the terrible 80s came when interest rates went from, from 5% to 17%. And he had had to borrow money to get that farm. So he borrowed at 5 and was now paying 17 And he couldn't make payments. And we visited with him unendingly. We would meet him in Indianapolis, discuss what... Well, how are we going to do this, and so on. So finally, Wynn said, well, how are we going to do this on the way home? I said, well, I don't know. The only thing I know, if you foreclose and you want to resell it, you're going to get $1,500, not $2,500. Well, he said, well, it would be wrong with just marking it down on that guy from 25 to 15 and not going through all that reselling it. So he marked it down. I don't think anybody's ever done that before. Mm -hmm. If the banks had done that in this present situation, we wouldn't be in this suit. Right. Yeah. Right. But Wynn understood that. Right. And that was a humanitarian and a good business thing to do. Sure. Right. Yeah. You both of you thought it through, and this seemed to be the right thing to do. It did. All right. yeah. And yeah. it was appreciated. Right. And the man was able to pay for it after that because mm -hmm. he rego renegotiated his loan, interest rates came down, he could go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What about um, when you were, what, tell us about some of your retirement activities. What did you do after you retired then? Did you do any traveling? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. I, I, my wife looked forward to my retirement for a, quite a long time. Sure. I was pretty unreliable as a husband. She raised the kids and I brought the bacon home. And I was, for instance, if you're in southern Indiana at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, you don't get home very early. That's so right. I was three or four hours home. And, and uh, she suffered that admirably. She was active in the school activities and, and the sororities and uh, those. And she worked at the Tippecanoe County Historical Association as a volunteer for years. And then finally as an employee, she ran the genealogy stuff. Oh, there. nice. That's good. And she enjoyed that. Sure. Did a good job of it. Right. And uh, anyway, when, then when I retired, she, she retired. And we traveled extensively. We had a daughter who got married and moved to San Diego and we would go to see her in the wintertime rather frequently and I enjoyed that immensely beautiful place to go I've heard yeah and uh, weather's nice weather is wonderful and we uh, traveled on the train a couple times which was an experience that's worth remembering but not to do again I think <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have a son in Tallahassee Florida and he, uh, we went there sometimes in the cold weather, uh, but um, he is in charge of an historic property in the middle of Tallahassee, which was once a plantation and has an 1840 antebellum house on it that 
they inherited in an annuity trust and uh, the man died. He let it go into bad repair. And then they hired Larry to manage this 20 acres in the middle of town. Heavens. With that house and about 15 or 20 outbuildings, old slave quarters, and, uh, and about 85 live oak trees on a great big and things. He's done that now for fifteen or more than fifteen years. He's does he he does does he live there? Yeah, I mean, this not is not in that house. Oh, okay. No, he lives in Tallahassee, but he uh, and he then he's the job has evolved. He began it was just mostly uh, superintending physical repair. He and and he was a he is training in historic preservation. That's how he got the job. So he was a little old lady about how it ought to be done, and he'd get people of considerable skill and great cost to do it like it ought to be done. And he did that for a while, and then it began to move along, and he renovated some of the outbuildings to where they could serve some public benefit, and then he began to have programs there. And this last year he's been, he has solicited, well, he 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 raided the annuity account to build a, an auditorium building, which will hold a couple hundred people, or three maybe. and. Uh, he charges admission for activities there. He, and he didn't, therefore didn't ride down the decline in stock values, and he's able to charge admission, so he thinks he did a pretty good thing. And he's, he's been at that uh, all these years, and he enjoys it immensely. He would like to come back to Indiana. My wife is from uh, a first family who came to Clinton County, Indiana in 1834. And uh, they lived in this community southeast of Frankfurt, and built a house in 1880, a great big thing that is no longer needed, never was really. And uh, so Larry thinks that is Mecca. He thinks that house is, he wants to keep that house. Well, he just doesn't, under, there's a lot of difference between an income property and, and a historic property. This is not an income property in any sense of the word either. I have real trouble renting it and I get Renters who were irresponsible. And yeah, it's hard. Yeah, what the house that's in the center of Tallahassee? What do they use it for? I mean, do people have events social there? events? Okay, uh, and, and rather prestigious ones. And then he's right there at the state capitol, and the politicians use his facilities. Oh, too. I bet. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. It's nice to have a little thing like that. Yeah, and things. then they do a lot of work with the school kids, sure. and uh, Florida State has some activities there and. He's very, very busy. Yeah. Do you have any other children, or just? The I children? have two others. And Phil, who is uh, on the ag economic staff here, teaches uh, foreign trade and uh, I guess foreign policy right now, and he does research work. He has a summer employment, and I have an itchy eye here. He you has summer employment. Next? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, okay. okay. Sorry. In uh, Colorado, in Fort Collins, Colorado, he works for APHIS. That is the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and they are over there in in in, uh, in Fort Collins. They are contemplating catastrophes in diseases. If a an anthrax uh, disease would hit South Bend, Indiana, in hogs, how big a ring would you have to draw around it, and 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 dispose of all the animals in that ring in order to intercept that? And that's what he's working on. He does computer stuff. Simulations, yeah, right. Uh -huh. Everybody does that, I guess. Right. Well, anyway, that's what he's doing. He goes out there to work with other people from from USDA on that subject. And uh, he has two children. One is a, a, a recently graduated with a master's degree, not two or three years ago, graduated with a master's degree here in industrial engineering. She's in California and working at a good job uh, north of San Francisco and and providing enough income for her husband who is in seminary. <laughs> you know the system. So if she can keep that going long enough to get him a... And I don't know what's going to happen when he graduates. He has to go somewhere else. If she loses that job, it's going to be tough. Yeah. So we'll cross that bridge when they get to it. And the other daughter of, of Phil is was a graduate of food sciences here. 
And I'm uh, very proud of that program because that was initiated by a dean of agriculture that I, and I know it was not a popular decision, but he instituted a food science department. And that has grown, and it's right. now one of the best in the nation. Right, yeah. And uh, so that's done. Anyway, she went there, and she went to work for the Red Gold Company that makes tomato stuff. It's an Indiana company. Indiana company. Right. And she likes her work. I thought they would give her a white coat and a microscope or something, but they didn't. They put her in charge of food of quality control on that bunch of tomatoes going down the line there. She's supposed to do that. Does she, she like it? it. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's yeah. nice. And then I have another son, that's this guy back there. Okay. He's got th three children, and he buys corn for the National Starch Company in Indianapolis. They process corn into various kinds of starches, much like they do over here. Or the, the Tate and Lyle. As Tate and Lyle, yeah. Right. Uh, they're competitive. Uh, but anyway, they do more different corns than Tate and Lyle does. They have some exotic corns, because starches are a lot of chemistry and some some glue for this and paste for that and and a food ingredient here and all these sure. different things right so he has to watch the, he regulates the inflow of corn he buys it and then tells the uh, the farmers when to bring it and he's at the telephone all day every day sure did he go to purdue as well he's a graduate ag economics okay yeah. all i i did this even this kid that's in florida doing history work went to Purdue University. I guess it never occurred to me you could go anywhere else. It just never seemed logical. Anyway, he went here to history. Both both he and Phil, who was in economics, took history. Not a big subject at Purdue in those days. But they were both very satisfied with the teaching they got. They got and full they liked professors. the program. Yeah, yeah full yeah. professors and, sure. and knowledgeable people. And uh, it wasn't an overwhelming school where you had a class of 300, you know. So they were happy. Got a little personal touch. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Then, then Larry went to Ohio State for a, a master's degree in historic preservation. And uh, so that's my family. Four kids and and all of them self-sufficient and making their own way. Oh, sounds good. And got the grandchildren as well. Let me yeah. switch a, a little bit. Uh, Chauncey Village, how has that changed over time? Chauncey, Chauncey Village? Village? Yeah. That was not, when you first came here, it was not as large as it is now, is it? Oh. And the no. levee was different. I don't remember Chauncey Village. You know what? Chauncey was one of the first establishments in West Lafayette. Right. And it, it was it, the original it, name for Lafayette. Yeah, and it sat there for a long, long time. Uh, the development north of it, I don't know much about that stuff that was held by private people south of of Sagamore. I don't know much about that. Okay, okay. But I know all about north of Sagamore, where we had farmland. Sure, right. Of course, you, you remember the, le well, the Triple X was there. Oh, yeah, yeah that right. was there. Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was there when the Indians left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dear. Oh, I remember that, all right. And then, uh, I understand the levee has changed. Oh, Before my, Sears yes. Came. I remember when we had... They a, used to have floods, I understand, there. All the time, yeah. Oh. We had, would you believe, a junkyard and a, a, a uh, burn pile on the levee down there where, where sure. the new, all the new stuff is. Sure. Where the skating rink is all that they burn stuff there almost every day and all day and it smelled terrible and smoke curled up and where'd they get the stuff from where were they burning? oh junk in town leaves and branches people bring stuff and whatever yeah whatever like a bonfire right it was a disposable place <laughs> right on the levee yeah <laughs> i remember that clearly and then i remember when the new bridges went in and all that stuff well i, I remember re telling jim williamson when he was mayor you ought to Pave that section of Yeager Road between Northwestern and 52. You ought to pave that. It's a local road, and a lot of people use it. And if you do that, you get a lot of votes because everybody likes that. Well, it's paved. <laughs> <laughs> now it's beat trap. <laughs> right, right. Oh, any particular awards or honors that you like? To Very to few. Okay. I uh, any, no. Come to mind. I got. Uh, I was uh, on the. Um, oh, I forget what it is. Distinguished Purdue Ags uh, Award mm -hmm. that they give at the fish fry. I got one of them, and I and on the, I got uh, made a member of the uh, Indiana Livestock Breeders Association. Got my picture up in the 
life science building, and then I uh, got some awards, would you believe, peculiarly, in the neighborhoods where these regional fires are located. People gave me a little token award for that. That's very nice. That's yeah. kind of special. That, well, yeah, it right. makes you feel like Purdue is respected there. That's right. Yeah, and I they were respected what you did. Yeah. Right. I had I had some troubles in my career. I uh, had we uh, I was I had eight farms when I began in six, 65 uh, to manage the regional farms. I had eight farms and then director Bolk called me in one day and says you got the Southern Indiana farm too, which had been under the jurisdiction of the agronomy department and had been the private province of one guy in the agronomy department who knew a lot about grass but nothing about money and it was a pit they lost money oh hand over fist and so Norbo called me in and said you're going to do that and I had blinked and said well okay I guess it pays all the same I'll go do it <laughs> but he was then he was still the agronomist involved and, and, he, and he was technically subordinate to me financially but he was still running the program down there and we had a lot of this and he humiliated me a number of times by saying why didn't I do thus or so well the reason was we didn't have any money <laughs> so that was a that was a strenuous time yeah. you have to work through some things sometimes no, no, you work through that's right but sometimes it all works out given time things come together that's right yeah yeah how about a um, favorite Purdue, got a tradition of Purdue that still comes to mind? Fish fry, I guess. Okay, you still go to that? <laughs> oh yeah, I was involved. Well, that's, you make a comment, that has changed over time. That has evolved, that has uh, progressed, has evolved into a higher, higher type of civilization. And it's also not on campus anymore. No longer on campus. Right. Yes. And then they went to the pork. Then we went to the pork. This year we had both, which is not right. important. People don't, I don't at least go there to eat, I go there to see what's going to happen. Yeah. And to see who gets awards and... And, and, to, and to network and to people that you've known over the years. Oh, it's a reunion of people, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a little, I think back, yeah, Purdue is a, it's just not the same to me. And yesterday I took a tour of the Burke Nanotechnology Lab, which is just as well been in China as far as I was concerned. I didn't understand that at all. But we had a brilliant young lady who explained it well, and if she doesn't give a test on it, I'm all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's not that not like I knew it. Uh, the thing I was just getting around to talk about was our annual Christmas party. Our annual Christmas party was held in uh, I don't know where it was. It must have been in Loeb Theater after a while, maybe in Fowler Hall for a while. Anyway, uh, we. Uh, it was a. It was, finally we didn't do it anymore. It was a kind of an insult to the non, to the non long termers. It was a. It was a reunion, a celebration of the old timers. We all got the joke, but the new clerical staff didn't know what that was all about, so they weren't much thrilled about it, and it kind of tailed off. But Maury Williamson ran it. Are have you interviewed him? Yes, I have. Yeah. How long did that take? Uh, we 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 try to limit it to a little over an hour. I mean, that seems you got more. You shut off in an hour. That's amazing. <laughs> did, yeah, it worked out very well. We did for his. I did a video though, so I did more okay. than yeah. That was well, nice he to did a, He was in charge of that foolishness, and he did a wonderful job of it. Right. Entertained everybody sure. except those who were new to the staff. They didn't know that Earl Butts, uh, uh, secretary was. Kathleen Rice, so we made a joke about that, you know. And, and one time, there was a guy named Gustafson who looked uh, a great deal like Fred Hodley, almost uh, personification. And so one time, Gustafson was imitating Hodley, and Maury had a pie ready to throw at him, and the lights went out, and a brief period of interruption, and then the lights came on, and there's Fred Hubby, where that Gustafson had been standing. <laughs> and Fred looked at Maury, and Maury looked at Fred. And Hubby said, I don't think you can do it. 
Or at the I don't think I can either. <laughs> well, that kind of in-house hilarity, you know, went over big. And that's what adds to it. That's, what, add, that's what made camaraderie among the angst. That's right. And now I think I think that all this big, big business has has been at the sacrifice of camaraderie. There used to be little groups to drink coffee and tell lies and have fun and exchange important information. Right. That's all by the board. My son works in ag economics. He said these people have no no camaraderie at all. They go to their little hole and run their computer. He said it gets bad with the guy in the office next to you sends you an email instead of opening the door and saying something. And that's the way it is. It's different, that's I know. Inhumane. Yeah, it's different. Well, I'm glad I'm not part of that. What about your, uh, got an outstanding event that you can think of that comes to mind? In your life? Well, I don't know. An outstanding event. event to me was on the 4th of July and I guess, 18, 1987 when the AGR house burned down in the middle of the night. And I got what was call. that? It it burned. What what house was that? Alpha Gamma Roll. It burned. It didn't burn down, but it burned beyond repair. What we were doing, I'm a nostalgic guy, and I like the old house, and I was going to... Where was it located? At 607 University Street. Okay. Yeah, perfect location. Well, you were in that fraternity. I was in that fraternity. And I was in charge of the corporation in, that did this stuff during the time of this remodeling we were going to do. And I was in favor of remodeling. That's always better to save string than buy new, you know. Right. So we were doing that, and we had the contractor, and they're working on it. And he made a mistake and left a piece of equipment on burning or something, and the house burned down. So then was we, there anybody hurt at all? No. Nobody was in there? No, okay. Because no it was being remodeled, so no one was in Nobody there. in there. That's why it burned so well. And it was a wood frame house at that time. And we had location, and we didn't want to give that up. They offered to put us other places, because the university would have been glad to have that. But uh, we wanted to stay. So after the house burned down, we built a new house. And I uh, hate to think, that's where Providence interceded. We would have had an old house now, uh, just 10, 15 years ago, and it would be an old house and then need a more repair and more remodeling. We now have a good house, and it's right. It's and at that, if you had to do all that remodeling, it would cost you a lot more. It'd be cheaper to buy a new one or yeah. build a new one. All right, so well, we're that, that's a philosophy that I I have learned kind of to accept, but it's hard. It is. That's right. Yeah. Any uh, any uh, other comments or closing things that you'd like to share with us? Something from mine or something that I didn't ask? Well, I would put in a word for my closest associate, okay. which is a man named Ted Speck, who had been working for my predecessor when I came uh, because I was a better politician than he was. They made me farm director, and he stayed in his old position. And he and I worked congenially for many, many, many years. And uh, with uh, sort of primitive stuff in a way, one telephone for two guys and uh, no copy machine and all, keeping books with a pencil and all that kind of stuff. But it worked. But it worked. And, and he and I worked cooperatively and congenially all those years. I don't remember of ever having had an argument with him. We debated some issues, uh, some silly things that here I did, but never had an argument. Mm-hmm. He's and now retired also. Does he live in the community? He lives in Pine Village, okay. where he lived all through the time. That was one reason he couldn't take the position. He also farmed about 500 acres on his spare time. He was a workaholic, and he still is. He worked for the university with equal diligence to his own. Right. Any particular hobbies that you, uh, you, you collect? Yeah, Anything my special? My only sin is reading, and I do that. That's very good. Unendingly. Right, yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for this interview. Is that all you wanted to know? Yes, got anything special that you want to No, I don't know of anything. No, it really worked out very well. Thank you very much.